Aloha and tala palava. I'm Karina Lyons, Vice President and Director of Research at the East West Centre and host of East West Centre Insights. The Centre is a cutting edge research and capacity building institute and we're based here in Hawaii and our mission is to forge a deeper connection and understanding between the East and the West. So every two weeks on this show, which is at Tuesday, which is on Tuesday at two o'clock, we'll be having a conversation with an East West Centre expert or a guest from our global network. So check us out at eastwestcenter.org slash insights. So today it's my absolute privilege to uh, host and introduce to you the former president of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, Dr. Hilda Heine. So Dr. Heine was the eighth president of the Marshall Islands, serving from 2016 to January 2020. She was the first female president of the Marshall Islands, the first female president in all of Micronesia, which is a country of five, uh, which is a block of five countries. And she was the first female president anywhere of Pacific Island descent. Dr. Heine has also served as the Marshall Islands Minister of Education, and she is currently an RMI Senator representing our atoll. And today we're going to be talking about the big issues facing the Pacific region. So climate change, women in government, US-China relations, education, and the upcoming negotiations on the compact of free association between the Marshall Islands and the US government. So President Heine, it's so wonderful to see you again. And thank you for joining us all the way from Majuro, Majuro Yakwe. Uh, yakwe, Yakwe and Aloha, uh, Karina. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. Now, thank you. And so you are in Madro on the Marshall Islands. And just to give us our bearings, so what time of day is it uh, there? So I don't know if I'm being disrupted uh, or not. Yes, today is Wednesday and uh, it's uh, noon uh, in Madro. Uh, we're, uh, I think we're two hours, uh, is it late, earlier? No, later That's right. than, than here at white time. Yeah, so I guess in the lockdown, um, everything sort of merges into each other. And uh, uh, RMI is still um, shut down, right, to um, anyone other than uh, Marshallese citizens. Uh, yes, actually, even Marshallese citizens cannot come in to the country uh, at this huh. point. So we're completely locked down. Um, there is some efforts by the military on Kwajalein to bring in essential workers. They go directly to Kwajalein, but that's about it for now. Okay. And um, the last time we spoke, which was yesterday, you were telling me that there are no COVID cases in the Marshall Islands. Is that still the case? It is still the case. Uh, uh, we're very, very uh, lucky to uh, not have to deal with the, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, currently. So everything is pretty much normal uh, in the Marshall Islands. Uh, there is no um, uh, quarantine of any kind, but uh, we we have some issues with uh, with food and um, other essentials coming into the country, as, uh, huh. but but it's it, it still works out for the most part. What an example! Now I've got um, a whole bunch of questions to questions. try to get through, so it's gonna it's gonna be like a, <laughs> a, a, a speed dating thing. So okay. I'm gonna start with right. the big one, uh, the big topic: climate change. So, and you've been a climate champion for RMI for the Pacific, um, and essentially for all small island developing states. So can you share your thoughts on global climate diplomacy? Like, is it is it working? <laughs> Well, uh, Karina, as you know, climate change, uh, the climate change challenge is really, it brings to question the future of uh, small island countries, especially atoll nations like the Marshall Islands. And as you know, there are only four atoll nations in the world, uh, three of them in the Pacific, uh, Marshall Islands, Kiribati, and Tuvalu, and Maldives in uh, the Indian Oceans. And we're, we're uh, really on the front line of the climate uh, change battle. So it makes, uh, makes sense for us to champion this issue uh, locally and internationally. Uh, in the Marshall Islands, as you know, wherever you stand in the country, you see the ocean. Uh, we're only uh, you know, at the highest point here is two meters above sea level. We have nowhere to uh, run to or nowhere to hide uh, really. So we're at the mercy of, uh, of uh, the ocean and, uh, and the weather. Uh, with respect to uh, climate uh, change diplomacy, um, I believe deeply in a multilateral approach to solving uh, global world problems. And the battle against climate change is really one of the, the gravest of these problems. 
uh, during my term as president of the Marshall Islands, I took every opportunity available to me to share our issues, uh, both bilaterally and uh, multilaterally. Um, I, I feel it was important to get the words out, to get support, to get uh, uh, people aware of uh, what we're going through in, in our part of the world. Um, I think we cannot leave this to chance and expect others to, uh, to take our, uh, our challenge. We have to take ownership of it and we have to be from the front. And that has been my belief. We need to get out there and, uh, and uh, talk about this and, and, and try to resolve it. At home, we have also uh, done and continue to do what we need or what we can to do to shore up our resilience uh, and even to do uh, what we can to contribute to the global fight uh, through some of the most uh, uh, aggressive um, renewable energy plans and also emission reduction efforts. We're, so we're not just talking about this, but we're doing our part. But unless the world keeps its promise to pursue in good faith the uh, efforts to limit global temperature, there is nothing we can do. You know, climate science predicts that by before the end of the century, countries like the Marshall Islands will be submerged under underwater. Um, and of course, we're having issues with uh, with our friends and uh, and allies. Uh, United States, of course, pulled out of the uh, uh, Paris Agreement. That was a disappointment for for us. Um, we hope that they will re-engage. Uh, this is an election here, so uh, anything is possible. But that the in the Pacific region itself. The Pacific Rim powers uh, are doing very little also to tackle the Pacific uh, security threat, which is climate change. Uh, China, on the other side, is the world's largest coal producer. U.S. has withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. Japan is promoting coal fire uh, power. And Australia is the world's largest coal exporter. And it plans to export more coal into, in the future. So these the actions of, uh, of our friends and neighbors are clearly out of steps with our concerns for security in the region. Um, and so, so we, you know, we can't be disappointed, but I think we continue, we need to continue to, uh, to, to continue uh, uh, international diplomacy as far as uh, climate change to bring, um, bring solution as much as we can. Mm. Yeah, I mean, thank you. You articulated some very difficult uh, mm -hmm. challenges there. Uh, and talking about promises and taking responsibility, um, let's let's talk about the U.S. and pulling out of the Paris Accord. You know, how optimistic are you that the U.S. will re-engage, given that it is an election year? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I suppose it depends on the change of administration. We're hopeful that uh, there will be change so that uh, Issues like climate change can change can come to the forefront. Uh, fortunately, though, for the various uh, uh, states and uh, cities, they've continued their uh, um, efforts to control uh, emissions, and that has been a, a blessing for for us. Even though nationally the U.S. has pulled back, the cities, you know, big cities and uh, and states have continued to do what they can, and so we're hopeful that they will re-engage. Uh, I hope you're right. Um, and uh, <laughs> I think I think I forgot to tell you that um, part of uh, this live format is that we'll also get questions from the public. Okay. Uh, and oh, so okay. we have one, yeah, so we have a question that's come in and um, it's not about any of the topics that I told you that we'd be talking about. It's about COVID, uh, but okay. um, I'd be interested in your views. And so somebody, and I, I don't know who it is, doesn't have a name here, said that they've read that the, um, the rate of uh, Marshallese COVID infection um, on the US mainland are higher than, um, than sort of the population rates. So why do you think that is, yeah. given you've been so well, yeah. in the Marshall Islands? Well, yeah, thank you. I, I th that's a very uh, uh, important concern for us. Uh, as, as you know, in, in Arkansas, I think that's where the, uh, the rates are quite high. And I, I'm hearing 12% higher than other uh, groups uh, and um, I, I think a lot of it is all you know it's it's uh, it's uh, community living style I mean we uh, have uh, large families in our homes and so it's very difficult to uh, isolate and to quarantine if there is a sick member in the family 
So it has a lot to do with, I think, lifestyles and how we, uh, we live as, as community members. And now, of course, uh, there is also the issue of uh, taking seriously the um, uh, wearing masks and uh, distancing, social distancing and all of these, I think we're, we're still learning and, uh, and, and uh, unfortunately, um, it's a little bit too late for many members of our uh, communities. Uh, there is also an uh, issue with where people are working and uh, mm -hmm. support from an uh, employer like uh, Tyson, for example. There has been some issues in terms of how they're taking care of their uh, employees in this regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like it's sort of the same issue everywhere. You know, the, the COVID mm -hmm. virus is a, is a collective problem and the solution mm -hmm. um, requires an investment from everybody, individuals and from um, employers, institutions like. And, um, and while we're just on this topic, you know, what advice would you give to the Marshallese communities in Arkansas and here in Hawaii? Well, you know, uh, I think I would uh, advise that uh, uh, we, um, we discontinue a lot of our community uh, activities. I mean, we're a culture that uh, comes together and uh, we share and um, in many aspects of our lives. And I, th I think we need to uh, be a little bit more careful in that respect so that we don't get, the, don't catch the, the, the virus or we don't spread it to other people that uh, are part of our community. So we just need to refrain from uh, usual activities. You know, we have a lot of birthday parties that uh, bring people together and, and other ways of uh, uh, coming together. We need to uh, put a hold on those for now. Yeah. Yeah, it, culturally it's very difficult and it's a real sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I had this conversation with my, with my mother. I'm always pointing her out. You know, it was just uh, people want to go to church and that was um quite an obstacle to overcome uh, uh but i think slowly but surely we're getting it so we have to remind um our families and friends that um they still have to continue to be to be careful and to socially distance so um let's talk about women and leadership now if that's okay <laughs> uh yes yeah, so um for those of you who don't know, which is um, most people, I guess, uh, President Heine was uh, the president of the Marshall Islands when I presented my um, credentials as New Zealand's ambassador. And I was so nervous. I prepared my bilateral <laughs> statement and had it worked through Capitol. And I got to wear the kōrowai, the feather cloak. Uh, and, um, and it was a first uh, hand sort of masterclass in, in sponsorship, because I remember uh, you told me, you asked me if I'd ever done this before and it was the first time and you, you just were, you just spoke to me very quietly in a, in a very calming way before I had to stand up on a podium before your entire government and give my speech. So um, I just wanted to take the chance to say thank you for that, for your sponsorship and your kindness and support. And um, yeah, based on your experience as a minister, as a politician, as a mother, as an educator, um, can you share your thoughts on the main issues facing women in the Pacific region? Mm. Well, you know, that's a, a very important topic for me personally and, uh, you know, and for many women. Um, as you know, new responsibilities in our modern world um, call women to be everything to everyone and much more. And so to meet expectations as well as to be taken seriously uh, we have a responsibility to ensure that we are well prepared to take on these multiple roles, traditional and modern ones, but to also create the uh, systems and networks to support one another. I really believe that women supporting one another uh, is a key uh, to success in getting into, uh, into our parliaments. You know, I, among many like-minded Marshallese and Pacific Island women, including yourself, Karina. Uh, we believe that the advancement of women and girl, you know, in our communities is correlated with the advancement of our, 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 our people and nation and, and region. So it's very important for us to, uh, to get to that level where uh, women are, uh, are living their full potential. Uh, in the political space, the Pacific uh, sees the lowest participation rates in the world. I think only about 12% yeah. of parliamentarians are women. It's a complicated right. issue, but you know, as you know, in many fields, uh, including politics, women have to be 
twice as better as their male counterparts to be uh, even considered or to be taken seriously. And so getting elected is just as hard as keeping the seat. We are voted out easier and, um, uh, you know, for inconsequential reasons where, you know, men would probably not be considered uh, uh, out, uh, they wouldn't be voted out for similar reasons. In the RMI, women's participation rate went from, uh, or regressed in the last election. We went from 10% in the national parliament to about right now 6%. Also in the, in the mayoral level at the uh, uh, local government, it went from 10% to 3%. So I'm not sure whether my being president had anything to do with, uh, with this impact. <laughs> I, I hate to think that that's what happened, but, uh, but we actually regress and the, and the consequences of this regression will be seen in, in years to come. Uh, you know, right now our women have one of the highest uh, birth rate in the region and uh, we continue to have high rates of domestic violence and women are not uh, economically uh, uh, employed or, you know, the, the employment level is quite low. So these are a reflection of uh, where we are as a, as a country and, uh, and where we are as women in our country. So we, we have a lot of work to do. I think my being president was, uh, was unexpected. It wasn't something that uh, uh, people expect. And I, I, I think the cultural card uh, can be played for or against women. And in many cases, uh, and in my case, uh, you know, I was told that I shouldn't be president because I'm a woman. And so that played a lot into my uh, real, you know, my re-election or not re-elected because uh, many uh, of our traditional traditionalists uh, consider that the post of our president should be uh, reserved for men. So we still have those kind of beliefs, and these are the these are the struggles and challenges that women have to face. Mm -hmm. But um, we continue to push forward. So uh, in many aspects of our uh, government, women are in in uh, in holding lots of uh, important positions. So there are some uh, improvements in those areas as well. But uh, when it comes to national uh, political institution, it seems to be uh, still reserved for, for men. Yeah, it's certainly not um, an issue in uh, the Marshall Islands only, because you are um, to date the only female leader of any Pacific country um, the, uh, within the region. Uh, Australia has had a female prime minister and New Zealand has had three. Uh, and I um, spoke about this issue just recently on a podcast and um, the host, um, a fantastic um, young Samoan guy based out of Brisbane, was genuinely shocked when I um, just rolled out these stats. Uh, and I know it's extremely complicated and you've certainly just outlined some of the issues, but um, you know, I'd love to just hear your take on why you think there aren't more um, women in, in government roles just across the region. I mean, I know a lot of young people will be really shocked to hear um, you say that there are still some views uh, in the Marshall Islands where people believe or um, men believe that the, the office of the president um, is reserved only for men. But across the region, uh, we're, all, we're very with different cultures, speak different languages. Uh, and yet, sort of, the stats say the same thing. There still aren't more women leaders. So, yeah, in politics, mm -hmm. why do you think that is? Uh, well, I think it's uh, it's it's really culturally driven. Um, you know, in 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 many cases, you know, we we talk about fifty percent of our populations are women. There are more women than men in many of our communities. But when it comes to voting, we don't support each other. Many of the women would would follow the. Uh, uh, the voting patterns of their uh, husbands or their uncles or their father or their brothers. And so they don't necessarily make their own uh, choices when it comes to political choice. So until we get to the level where women are independently, independently making their own political decisions and political choices, we'll continue to be where we are, I think. And uh, so there's a lot of work to do there.
There certainly yes. is. Amen to that. Yeah. Uh, my team are telling me uh, I could talk to you all day, but we've only got another ten okay. minutes. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip to some of the questions that I'm really keen about, uh, okay. keen to know about. So, uh, the Marshall Islands has diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but PRC uh, China remains interested in the region, uh, as you know, as you well know. And so, can you please tell us a little bit about China's role in the Marshall Islands, and whether you have any uh, concerns or just views about uh, the impact mm -hmm. of Chinese activities in your country? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as you know, Marshall Islands is one of the four Pacific Island countries that have uh, diplomatic ties with uh, with Taiwan. Uh, we we were six uh, two years ago or a year ago, and now we're down to four. Just a so year ago. Can, just a year ago, yeah, when yeah. Uh, uh, Solomon Islands and Kiribati uh, switch over to China, the PRC. Now there remains uh, only four, and we are uh, four of the smaller countries in the in the region. All of the big countries are affiliated with PRC. Mm -hmm. So the presence of PRC is quite uh, extensive in the Pacific. There is no question that uh, China in the Marshall Islands has been uh, quietly nourishing its influence in the private sector, uh, in the Marshall Islands, through the private sector, through economic, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, projects. <laughs> Among almost all of our small uh, moms and pop stores are owned by PRC citizens here. And PRC's presence is more also pronounced in our uh, fisheries and in our uh, in, you know, uh, fisheries sector here. Um, so, China continues to cultivate the uh, interest among Marshallese leaders uh, to switch diplomatic ties to the mainland. I think the public is more generally pro-Taiwanese. So uh, I don't think that the switch is likely to take place soon, but one never knows. You know, my government never uh, entertained this question and uh, hopefully the current government will not and, and they will continue to nourish and expand our relationship with Taiwan. And uh, what about your assessment of the U.S.-China rivalry in the Pacific and its impact on, on either the Marshall Islands or the region generally? Well, um, yeah, that's a very interesting <laughs> uh, um, a question because, you know, we see these two giants jumping into the Pacific almost like, uh, you know, jumping into a pool, the huge pool that is the Pacific region and sending their ripples all across the uh, uh, the ocean that affects and 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 you know those ripples come onto our shores and we see that uh, everywhere. Uh, Pacific Island countries uh, are getting uh, a lot of support from uh, China. I think China is now uh, uh, spending in the last ten years one point eight billion dollars in the region, and um, during these last ten years, uh, China became uh, uh, the second largest uh, donor in the in the in the Pacific uh, region, uh, right after Australia, uh, it overtook Japan and New Zealand. So uh, they're, they've been making their marks here. Trade activities also increased with China, something like 12 folds. So uh, they're uh, making their presence here. And uh, unfortunately the US and its allies are, uh, I think they're a little bit, uh, little bit too late or their efforts here are sporadic, they're not consistent. The level of engagement is not always there. The level and the type of engagement that Pacific leaders look for are not always there. So I think it's important for the US and its allies to, to rethink how they deal with Pacific leaders, uh, to take them seriously, and to look at their uh, priorities uh, seriously. Thank you for saying that so clearly, because it's something that um, you know I've talked about a lot, and uh, and that I've certainly said to um, both uh, Chinese and American counterparts. But it's always good to hear directly from somebody who uh, ran a whole country. Uh, and um, yeah, I guess in the last in the last segment of the show, time goes really quickly. Um, yeah, I'd love to talk about the upcoming negotiations between uh, the Marshall Islands and the U.S. about renewing the financial provisions of the. Uh, the Compact Free Association. Um, and uh, obviously it's a, a huge, uh, an important issue for the Marshall Islands, for the US, and uh, also for the state of Hawaii. 
So uh, just generally, what do you think the main challenges are in the negotiations? Uh, and then more importantly, I think, what is the Marshall Islands uh, trying to get out of these negotiations? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, you know, as you know, the economic package under the contract uh, ends in 2023. So uh, one of our asks in the negotiations uh, would be to extend the economic package. Uh, we've been talking about that, and I think the United States is, uh, is amenable to the extension. Uh, it remains to be seen how long the extension would be. Uh, but there is also uh, our interest in engaging U.S. on addressing the nuclear issue and mm -hmm. uh, bring to closure a lot of the issues there. Now, right. one of our uh, concern and, um, with, uh, with these negotiations is that the United States might not be willing to put the nuclear uh, issue on the table. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that to me, that's a red line for the RMI negotiating side. I think we need to make sure that that is stable. Otherwise, we shouldn't be talking to the U.S. if they're not willing to uh, address the nuclear legacy. That is important and needs to be uh, taken care of. It has been so long, too long already. Uh, and it has uh, created uh, trust issues between the two countries because uh, the U.S. hasn't been willing to Settle this issue to the uh, satisfaction of, uh, of the Marshallese leadership, but um, yeah, I think those are, that's a ma major concern for for me, and I hope for the negotiating team. Uh, another concern is the the, um, the fact that we're negotiating on, <laughs> online. You know, this is yeah. such a serious <laughs> issues, and all the negotiations are being done online. And U.S. is hoping to wrap this up by December, and you know I don't know whether they will have any face to face. To me, that's a concern. I think such an important issue needs real uh, face to face discussion. Uh, there are lots of uh, issues to deal with here that, that that would impact the relationship and the Marshall Islands uh, into the future, and deserve real uh, uh, serious uh, discussions. Yeah, indeed, the modalities do make it really tricky, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. particularly with such an important um, negotiation. And so you outlined two of the major concerns, the nuclear issue, um, and for those of you who are not aware, um, the US conducted a series of nuclear tests from about 1955 to about 65, the Castle Bravo test, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and there ha have been ongoing issues ever since due to radiation mm -hmm. and um, it's severely and significantly affected the, um, the ecosystem there as well. So that's the nuclear legacy and the other issues and modalities. But um, I think the, the, there's, not, there's only time for one last question, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, because I, I have lots of questions. But, yeah. Uh, just stick, sticking with the COPA negotiations and concerns, what do you think the main challenges are facing Marshallese citizens here in Hawaii? And how does that play into the negotiations? Uh, yeah. And I guess what I'm looking for is sort of answers. How can they be addressed for the community here? Well, yeah, I think uh, not only for Hawaii, but in the other uh, states where Marshallese or FAS residents are, are living, I think there is an uh, issue of lack of protection for COPA. Uh, residents all across the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, their ability to access uh, health care. Uh, at one point, they were able to, they were eligible to receive Medicare, but then, you know, that went out. Uh, now there is the discussion on the, uh, well, I'm trying to remember, public charge regulations that, you know, how are they going to treat uh, FAS residents? Again, that comes into question and uh, uh, people feel uh, a little bit restless because they don't know what those uh, public charge regulations would look like and how they would mean for uh, for FAS citizens in the U.S. So this is a major concern and that uh, created a lot of uh, animosities for uh, Micronesian residents in you know where they're residing in in, in Hawaii, for example. Uh, there are issues with housing, uh, medical care, and uh, people feel that the FAS residents are uh, taking over some of what they should be eligible for or what they're meant for. And so create animosities between groups. And, and I think it's unfair for the states to have to pick up the, the tap for a lot of these issues that are federally mm. created. Uh, mm. And so, mm. you know, we see discrimination and, and, and we understand we're the, we're the last group of uh, migrants to come to, to Hawaii, for example. So there is bound to be some discrimination, but I think some of these other issues, if, if there is uh, uh, 
uh, protection of COBA residents by the U.S. federal government in any of the states, I think that would alleviate some of these uh, issues that we, we're experiencing now. Dr. Heine, thank you so much for your insights and for joining us today. And that was an extremely measured response. I know that a few congressmen who would really appreciate those comments. Um, but thank you again. You've always been so generous with your time uh, for me and for everybody in, in the region. So, um, and uh, hopefully stay safe. And uh, hopefully we'll get to talk again soon. And for everybody tuning in today, thank you very much for, uh, for watching East West Center Insights. Mahalo. Thank you.